there was a study published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition a while back. It took a look at over 7,200 people. I think it was like three clinical trials. It was a lot of data. And this particular study was looking at how quickly people lose weight if their starting weight is heavier. So they looked at things like waist circumference. They looked at overall weight. They looked at BMI. They looked at body fat percentage. At the end of the day, the meta-analysis ultimately determined, based on these clinical trials, that the larger the waist circumference, the heavier the weight, the higher the body fat to start, the more weight that person is going to lose. So for example, if you have someone that is 300 pounds and someone that is 250 pounds, and you put them on the same diet, there is a high, high likelihood that the person that is 300 pounds is going to lose more weight. They're going to lose more weight faster, even if calories are equated for, for their weight. Now, there's a couple of things that might come into play with that. For one, they are a bigger body of mass. So thermodynamically, every time they move a smidgen of a muscle, they are burning more, right? Because they weigh more, there's more mass. So physical activity becomes more impactful. But there's also mysterious things, like we've heard of the whoosh effect, which is somewhat indescribable, where it's like when someone that is very overweight starts losing weight, they lose weight really fast. Sometimes it's thought to be water, but then when you look at DEXA scans, sometimes that doesn't always add up. So there's like these thermodynamic, almost weight loss mysteries that occur. Now, the reason that I'm mentioning all of this is because there was a relatively recent study that came out and it was looking at time-restricted eating, just simply consolidating calories a little bit. It wasn't even fasting. And it compared that to what was called a usual eating pattern. It was really fascinating because basically what they did is in a one-to-one -one fashion, they took people to eat between the hours of 8 a.m. and midnight. That was their eating block. The other group of people were allowed to eat between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. So it wasn't like huge, huge differences. As a matter of fact, people doing the quote unquote usual eating protocol weren't even eating up until midnight most of the time. They were just allowed to, right? Point is, is that what they found is that when they matched calories and everything was done in a metabolic kitchen, it was like spot on to a T exactly what it should be metabolically. They really found that they lost about the same amount of weight. Like it was negligibly different. But what was really interesting was that the usual eating pattern group, the group that just did regular caloric restriction, not a consolidated eating block, they started out at 103.7 kilograms, whereas the other group started out at 95 kilograms. In theory, the group that started at the lower weight actually lost more because they both lost the same amount of weight but as a percentage of their total weight, the group that started lighter lost more, right? Because if, let's just say, for example, they both lost 20 pounds in 12 weeks. Well, if you lose 20 pounds starting at 200 pounds compared to losing 20 pounds starting at 300 pounds, you can see there's a clear difference. As a percentage of weight, they lost more. Now, the study could also be flawed in the sense that people that are going to start out heavier are going to probably lose weight faster. But that's not really what I'm getting at with this study because we have covered that study in a fasting sense in a different context before. I wanna focus more on what was really not talked about and that was the glycemic control aspect. Look at the charts that are on the screen right now. These charts show the difference in fasting glucose and what is called HOMA-IR, which is essentially a biomarker for insulin resistance. The study itself said that there was a statistically insignificant difference between the two. Now, without getting too kind of granular, statistically significant doesn't necessarily mean that something's not significant. It doesn't mean that it's not an important result or outcome. Because you can see clearly on this chart that the people that were doing the time-restricted eating group, like where they were consolidating their eating and not eating after 6 p.m., they had a significant improvement, in my opinion, of their fasting glucose and their HOMA IR. What's fascinating is that they had more improvement than the other group, despite weighing less. So we do know that generally when people are very overweight, the moment that they make a lifestyle change, they start having huge impacts. 
Like it does make a bigger impact. It's like a bigger dent on them than someone that's a little bit lighter weight. The fact that the people that were already a little bit lighter had a bigger impact on their glycemic regulation and their insulin resistance in the people that were overweight speaks volumes for this. What's really interesting is that insulin resistance in and of itself will trigger more obesity or can trigger more obesity because when insulin is present, it does impede the action of certain catecholamines. It does impede the action of hormone sensitive lipase, which acts like a pair of scissors to sort of snip off the fatty acids off of a triglyceride or a glycerol molecule, which is a triglyceride. So by being able to snip those fatty acids off, the fat can be burned. So when insulin is chronically high, in the case of insulin resistance, you are impeding some of the fat loss. And that doesn't fly in the face of thermodynamics. Calories still matter, but it does mean that maybe other things start to get burned. Maybe instead of being able to oxidize fat, you start breaking down muscle or you start going through glycogen more. The list goes on, but it could impede fat loss. That's why people with insulin resistance a lot of times will start going through more muscle wasting and maybe hold on to more fat, even though their total weight stayed the same, right? So what we see with this is that, okay, insulin resistance improved, and all they did, all they did was eat in a nine hour block instead of a 12 hour block. That's it, that's it. How would that impact weight loss later on? If you improve your insulin resistance, you can probably end up burning fat easier. Now, what I would have probably implemented into this study to make it more effective is I would have monitored exactly what they were eating after like time-restricted eating or after fasting, right? Like for me, after time-restricted eating, protein is the most critical thing. You need to break your fast with something that your body can use to increase protein synthesis and preserve the muscle. Because with any kind of caloric deficit that could be occurring in this particular case with this study, serious caloric deficit in both groups, there is a serious risk of muscle wasting. And that study that I'm referencing didn't measure that. They didn't DEXA scan them, uh, and, and, or at least they didn't report like the muscle, right? There was probably some muscle loss in both groups. So like for me, for example, when I break a fast, usually it's a simple protein shake or maybe a piece of chicken. For a lot of people, I recommend whey protein either whey protein isolate or good quality whey protein concentrate. I put a link down below for the one that I use. It's from a company called Bomar Nutrition. I recommend them because they use allulose as their sweetener. Allulose, if you've seen my videos, like breaking down the studies on that, amazing compound. It matches sugar essentially in the digestive tract and blocks the absorption of sugar. So it has an impact on glycemic control even more. So that's why I've pivoted a lot more towards Bomar's whey protein over the last couple of years. So that link down below is a 15% off discount link. Not to mention, it's probably the best tasting protein powder you'll ever have. They have a brand new double fudge, which literally tastes like double fudge. And if you make it with like either that fair life milk or a little bit of raw milk, it tastes like a milkshake. So you're getting all your sweetness, you're getting all that stuff and it feels amazing. So that link is down below. Highly recommend you give them a shot. This study, and I've talked about this in another uh, video, they weren't as active in the time-restricted eating group. Now there's a theory there. It's called the constrained energy model. It is fascinating. I've talked with Dr. Paul Saladino on it, uh, on, a, on a video, on an interview. And I know people don't like Paul and some people do, but whether or not you like Paul or not, the constrained energy model is real. It is a very real thing and it still needs some flushing out. But essentially what it suggests is that when you eat less, your body naturally makes you move less and you may not even realize it. It's like, for example, I ran seven miles this morning. Yay, tooting my own horn. I went for a pretty long run. There's a good chance that unbeknownst to me, when I'm sitting down at my desk, I might be fidgeting less because my body is saying, hey, wait a minute. You have a set level we want you to be at and you already burned through a lot of that today, so we're gonna downregulate a lot of things and you're not even gonna realize it. So maybe I'm not fidgeting as much. Maybe I'm not moving around. I'm not bouncing my leg or, or tapping my fingers. All those little things add up. So it downregulates your non-exercise activity thermogenesis. Now, in theory, any caloric restriction would do that. So when you start reducing calories, the body's gonna say, well, let's go ahead and just chill everything out so that we preserve, because this is quote unquote abnormal, okay? So the body will conserve. Now, with fasting or time-restricted eating, perhaps people were consolidating so much that their periods of caloric restriction were 
a little bit more exacerbated, right? Think of it like this for a second. You have one group of people that are reducing calories evenly over the course of a day, and you have another group that eats a lot and then fasts for like 20 hours a day. In theory, over 24 hours, the caloric restriction is the same. But in the moment of that fast, the caloric restriction is significantly more. You are cranking it down all the way. So rather than a dimmer switch that's turned down to maybe eight or seven or six, you're cranking it down to zero when you cut out eating altogether. Even if at the end of the day, your calories are about the same. What I'm saying here is that perhaps the time-restricted eating group turned it down so much that their body started to conserve so they had less physical activity. Because what we saw in this study, despite that lower activity level, they still had a stronger improvement in their glycemic control. What this demonstrates, and I know it was a long-winded way of saying it, but what it potentially demonstrates is that if you are not as active of a person, time-restricted eating might be really, really good for you because it warrants you the ability to potentially reduce your glycemic load and reduce sort of that fasting glucose and HOMA IR with less activity. So when you're more overweight or you're injured or you're just older, yeah, maybe it works really well because there's no denying that exercise is one of the most powerful ways to improve glycemic profiles, okay? But what if exercise is hard and what if you also just don't have the time? So we see this data and we understand a lot more. So yes, it was a study that sort of debunked some of the fasting stuff out there, but it really helped teach us a lot. So what is the takeaway from this? What can you take away? Well, by just consolidating your eating three hours less, give yourself a defined block. It doesn't need to be fasting, but say, I'm just not gonna eat until 8 a.m. 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., those are gonna be my hours. And then when you do break your fast at 8 a.m., start it with something high protein and if you have carbs, try to have some allulose with it. These kind of things make a big difference. If you're a heavier person, you might need to account for the fact that you're going to lose more in the beginning and it's gonna get harder as you go on. And it's much better as you lose weight to increase activity than it is to just restrict calories. As you lose weight, rather than saying, I need to eat less, try to eat the same amount, but move more. That way you build muscle, but you keep your metabolism high. As always, keep it locked to here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.